say certain things. Okay. Cool. Um, so I'll take an official start. Welcome everyone to this little evening. It's I'm going to read a little bit from my book, but I called it a presentation because I have a slideshow that I created last year. I modified it a little bit. Um, if you have any questions, though, feel free to ask. I started working with this information seriously in 2012, um, and so it's been over 10 years. It came about because every time I would tell a story of my family and living in Vietnam, people would say, you've got to write about that. And I'm like, oh my God, you know what that's going to entail? And I kept saying no, 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 until finally it just became obvious it was something I had to take up. So I got my master's and worked on it. Well, I, I didn't write solidly 10 years, but it was on and off. Always there, like a long, long term paper. <laughs> so um, I call it a unique story, and the, the um, title is For the Love of Vietnam A War, a Family, a CIA Official, and the Best Evacuation Story Never Heard. It's kind of long, but if you look up any kind of Vietnam stories, most of them have very long subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> so I felt, I felt okay doing that. Before we go, uh oh. Um, does anybody want to share right off the bat anything that comes to mind? The first thing you think of when you hear Vietnam. Just curious, of, like what your impressions are. Yeah. Very tropical. Very tropical. Nice. Works with my. I think of war. War. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a lot. Division, like division, the country. Yeah. Divided. Um, our country or their country? Uh, both. Actually. Both. <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking ours. Yeah. yeah. which is the story that everybody's like, you gotta tell that story. Um, I just think it's just such a quaint plot. Within an accelerated timing factor, you helped activate a motivational implementation program through a coordinated approach on an orchestrated basis with all deliberate speed. <laughs> <laughs> so just obviously a very heartfelt from one of his, um, his coworkers that he, he helped out, um, one of the Vietnamese people. This is my father. He died in 1992, just 16 years after getting out. He was, he's a veteran, was in the Navy. Um, he, he always said he wanted to go to war, but I think he, it was right at the end of World War II. How old was he when he died? Um, 68. So, so did the war have anything to do with I, the death? I believe so, yes. Um, he, uh, both my parents, so this is my mom. Because it's a family story, I can't really tell the story without getting a little bit of family background. Yeah. Um, they were married on August 2nd, 1958, and they wrote home that they were the luckiest people in the world that found each other. My mom wrote letters all through her life, really. I have letters from the 50s all the way through the 80s. This is uh, another picture of her and, and a little bit of um, an example of her handwriting and her typewriter, she had this cursive typewriter, man, <laughs> So she died just 12 years after he died, and she was 12 years old, younger than him, so they both died at about 68. Um, when they were married, they were fun-loving, party animals, they'd be out all the time drinking, and so 
they had a very social drinking life and then throughout their years it became this habit and then after Vietnam it became alcoholic and they both died of cancer. And it was so, it was, um, I feel like Vietnam did, was not kind to my family, um, but that's part of the story. My mom had, yeah, she's Catholic, so had seven kids. This is us when, um, at Christmas in the Vietnam year. So she was a bit of a hero in being able to, she, can you imagine she moved these kids three times with all, everything that we had. Now we have two children, hi. Um, welcome. So again, this is just an image of, of can you imagine taking a family like this into what now? Seven children. Seven children. Wow. Which one? Mm -hmm. Which one? I mean, this is me over here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, this my younger sister Kim is is adopted from Korea. And then my brother Jimmy is doing the Nixon, <laughs> the crew side. I don't know where he got that because there's no, back then there was no, he didn't even have TV in Vietnam. So maybe he saw a newspaper or something, or <laughs> so he picked that up. Uh, my brother John is right there to the left. My sister Marina in the middle is my brother Mike, who's also passed away. Um, and then my brother Chris, uh, who's, Marina's the oldest and Chris is the next oldest. And they were pretty good um, resources for me. I'd always be calling and saying, what about this, what about that? Interestingly enough, none of us have very coherent memories of it. And that kind of uh, confirmed a little bit in my mind how much trauma was involved while we were there. Um, we just, we didn't realize it until as we got older and older, you're like, hey, wait, something might have gone wrong. So it's interesting, back here, my parents were married on August 2nd, 1958. It wasn't until I was doing this research that I realized it was exactly six years later on August 2nd that the Tonkin Gulf incident happened. Is everybody familiar with that incident? Um, so it was in the Gulf of Tonkin. There were, we had military um, ships there and the North Vietnamese, of course, were there because it's farther, as far north. There was firefight going on and it, America portrayed it as they, they were attacking us. And so now we have a reason to go in and attack them. It became very clear, not, it didn't take very long for it to be really clear. And the pilot of one of the, he was a reconnaissance plane going around, he's like, I don't see anything, I don't see anything. There's not, there's no um, uh, torpedoes going in. And Congress was just gung ho. They just passed this resolution. We're in the war, they didn't declare war, but they declared that we could now use force against the North Vietnamese. We'd already been in the country for, um, as advisors for quite a while, but. Don't, don't. Okay. Yeah. So this was, it just, I just found it fascinating that it was like exactly on my parents' anniversary. And then in 2014, I didn't even realize this too, I went down to see the Vietnam Veterans Wall. It was exactly, um, 50 years after oh, the Tonkins. So these are kind of like, oh, it's so interesting. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I had to go down there in order to um, write about this. I needed some kind of blessing or benediction. Um, many of the years when people would say, you should write about Vietnam, I'd be like, are you kidding? Like, look at me, I was eight years old when I was there. Do you know how many soldiers died there? What kind of, you know, horrible things they went through. And me, this little girl, essentially, is gonna come up and be like, hey, let me tell you about Vietnam. And I was terrified. And also, she's like, I don't wanna, um, now everybody talks about, you know, um, appropriating somebody yeah. else's story. Yeah. That be, This all happened before that, that <laughs> idea came out. But I did feel this really strong compulsion. In fact, I just have to say, when I was, what happened was I got really sick. I lost a job. I was fired. I was living in my son's housing all in Albany, like on Hudson Avenue, which is just like this wreck of a place. And so I had nothing to my name, essentially, just at the bottom as you could be. And I called a friend. I was like, well, I guess I'll go back to writing instead of a journalism degree. She goes, well, what are you going to write about? And I was like, I don't know. And she, and she said, I think you should write about Vietnam. And I'd known her a long time, and she had a lot of my dad's books I'd actually given to her. And she said, I was looking at your dad's books at the time. 
And I am not kidding, it was just very strange. I felt like I had been like hit by a wave. I, I was in Washington Park, I kind of buckled over and I gasped and it's just, you don't have to write about it, it's so painful. I was like, I'm not crying, I don't know what that was. But it really felt like something outside of me washed over me and I can't make it any more logical. It was just very, very uh, esoteric, kind of woo woo. But in 2014, I was like, oh, I had the chance to go to, down to the wall. I took this picture and, and you'll have to excuse me because sometimes I just get overcome with emotion when I, it has to do with the vets. And um, I, I was like, wow, that's a great shot. And I'm looking at my camera back in the day when you just used your, your camera. I saw him running away, walking, so I ran after him and I said, excuse me, sir, could I use this photo? I'm writing this book and I want to be able to portray what happened in Vietnam. And I was like, I'm like, my voice is shaking. I'm like, here's a man who was in battle and obviously lost a friend. And his wife was like, his friend was three days from coming home. And he finally found his name on the wall. So, um, but he looked at me and he said, he was like, people can't forget. They cannot forget this. And I said, that's what I'm trying to write about it. And he shook my hand and I'm like crying. And he's, you know, he was teary eyed, but I'm like, I'm like, why am I? I'm the one who's being emotional. But um, I felt like that was the blessing I needed. That was the benediction. And I looked him up before last year, and both he and his wife had this as their Facebook photo. Um, and so I felt really like honored and gratified. I did try to reach out to him and I, I didn't get any response from either of them. And he wasn't on Facebook anymore, sort of, so I kind of think he may have passed away, um, which is happening, you know, because a lot, it's been 50 years. So, um, but again, the coincidence of all this happening on August 2nd was just very interesting. Um, Ken Burns did this documentary a few years ago, 2017, and I like the way he portrayed this because he really captured the, um, well, one, you have the American soldier on the top and the Vietnamese person on the bottom. Um, it was, you know, over 58,000 of our soldiers died, went off to a foreign country, no texting, no email, it took three weeks to get a letter. They didn't even know Vietnam was there. Going through the jungle where everybody's the enemy, and three million Vietnamese killed. I mean, we can't, that was like a tenth of their country. So that's astronomical. And it, of course, as you said, it, it like polarized American society. Hi, welcome, sit where we are. Just like, and challenge our faith in ourselves. Before that, you know, America, we were just kind of really on top of the world. But this division just was crushing and it calls into question the belief in our own exceptionalism. Um, so in many ways, it just really was devastating. And why were we there? So for the United States, it was the Red Scare. So we were scared. Did we have any reason to be scared? I think we did. Um, my dad would, would say, after I was fighting the ghost of Stalin, um, and we, of course we had the domino theory Eisenhower put forth that if Vietnam falls, then we're gonna have every other country go. And before we know it, Oh, we're gonna be, uh, no, it's not there. Um, before we know it, we're gonna have like these people on our shores taking over our land. We, this is um, Stalin and Mao Zedong. And the thing is, communist leaders, communist dictators, so we're afraid of them. They killed 40, 60 million of his own people. Mao Zedong killed 45 million of his own people, own people. So, of course, we're in the United States going, holy cow, they killed their own people. What are they gonna do to us? if this domino theory works. So when you're in that perspective, of course, and talking about my father is always like, he and I were really close, and, um, but I was still really uncomfortable, like this story's gonna come off as like hero worship, like he could do no wrong. I, you know, I would have been out with my older, I, mean, I would have been out with the daisies, putting them in the, in the people's guns. He's like, you know, we gotta be there, we gotta fight off. These people were right to be in Vietnam, so we would have differed a lot on that. Um, and in fact, sometimes I feel this is Ho Chi Minh, who was the leader of the North Vietnamese for many years. He, um, and his name means bringer of light. He studied all over the world. 
um, was very intelligent. And he started off as an intelligent, compassionate person. And then as he got so caught up in, in protecting his country, then you know, the, the North Vietnamese were vicious fighters. Um, but this, I went, to, uh, I went to Vietnam in 2015. This is a copy of his Declaration of Independence. He took pretty much word for word from Thomas Jefferson, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And he, he gave, you know, he said, I'm taking this right from America because they started their own country. They created a union from these different parts. And long history of Vietnam is they were a lot of different parts too. It wasn't just like always this one country. They had different city states and things. Um, but he wanted his own country back. They had years. China was in there. Japan was in there. The French were in there. They were like, we just want our country back, like anybody would want. So he writes to Truman and says, will you help us get the French out right after the end of World War II? And the U.S. supported him in World War II, defending Vietnam against the Japanese. But Truman didn't answer. We were, the French were our allies. There were also reasons why we might want some of the resources Vietnam had. So no answer. Had Truman maybe answered that letter, I always wonder. Maybe the whole thing could have been avoided. <coughs> so while were we were there, my dad was in the Navy, and he was in a V-12 program. Has anybody heard of that? It's kind of obscure. It's a precursor of ROTC in, um, in World War II. But he got, he was pinpointed as having an affinity for German language. And then he got routed into language classes rather than the navigation classes. So when it came time to test, he failed by one percentage point. He kind of figured things out on his own, but not enough. So his sister said he was happy. He, he ended up going to New Orleans, having kind of a party time, being a carpenter. And he bombed out, but he could handle it. I always, when I heard that story, I was like, oh, that's kind of the first indication of, he actually just had a really nice, easygoing uh, character. Um, so he could pretty much roll with the punches. So after, but so, oh, oh I took one out. So that had, he, he ended up deciding, you know, he, he got just honorably discharged after his name he came. Hi, Jim, come on in. <laughs> it's okay. I just passed the Truman part, so I'll have to catch you up on that. <laughs> you can. Uh, I know that. Um, so after, after he, he got back to Washington, D.C., did some more schooling, and then decided he was going to join um, foreign services, of, a.k.a. the CIA. So he applies, and he gets taken in, and because of the nature of things, I don't, he didn't keep a diary. I don't have a list of all the things he did between um, the early 50s and uh, um, through, through the 60s. But in 72, <clears throat> oh, then of course he went to Germany. And my brother Chris was like, what do you think? He spoke German, they were in Berlin. He probably was going into East Germany undercover. I was like, oh my God, I can't even imagine. So hopefully I could find this classified <laughs> document. At some point, or unclassified. But in '72, um, I, there's a um, website called PsyOps that I found, and he, the the um, writer Herbert Friedman, said Nixon went to China, so Jim had to close down his long-running Chinese broadcast from Korea. And it took me a while to put this together, but so my dad ended up in uh, psychological warfare, um, psychological operations which is a really scary way of saying, if you can influence the way people think, then you can sway them. It's like, if, if you capture their hearts, their minds and bodies will follow is their slogan. Propaganda is also, you know, the common word, which everybody else's message is propaganda. So ours is actual fact, but there's a prop propaganda is just a, a loose word for persuasive writing. So it took me a while to realize though, that I, I, my dad, I believe, had something to do with setting up Nixon to go to China because he was broadcasting into China pro-American um, propaganda. And when I found this out, I was like, well, that's just kind of really cool because in 72, 
we were living in Korea while my dad was doing that work, and he had to um, change jobs, so he got sent to Vietnam. Um, oh, early in his first term, Nixon, through his national security advisor, Kissinger sent settled overtures hinting at warmer relations to the PRC government. So I think that's what my dad's work was while we were in Korea. This is a picture of my, myself and my brother Jimmy. And that, <laughs> this was, I guess, the kinds of things we did on the weekend. We just was the anti communist exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the one that most everybody was doing about that time. <laughs> so it was just a very, very unusual childhood. Um, so, so in 1970, my uh, father's in DC, and then he gets sent to. Korea. And so we all go as one big happy family. My mom packs up the six kids, and um, we got Kim in Korea when we were there. And then um, we're there for two years. My dad gets sent to Vietnam, but that was 1972, and the Paris Peace Accords were had just been signed. So they were there was just still like too much tension in the area. So we went to Taiwan. And that was like our safe haven. My dad would come back every six weeks. And I think it took him all day to get there. I'm not sure why. I remember them saying it was such a long flight. Um, and um, so that was a hard life, two years apart, seeing him every six weeks. And um, he wrote to my mom, too, that it's, it's really terrible. I got I have the best job I think that, that I'll ever have. And it's, but it's also the worst case. It's worst setup because I'm separated from you guys. Um, this is uh, the embassy. He didn't work there. He worked at a, another place right down the street. I'll show you the picture. But um, Frank Snap, I put, it's one of my favorite Vietnam books. It's back there on the table. Um, said, you know, if you were in the CIA and hadn't been to Vietnam, you were going to get there sooner or later. So it was, it was natural that my dad was sent there. His co worker wrote this book, Get Out Any Way You Can, the story of the evacuation of House 7, which was where he worked. This theoretically was the, um, the, the place, the old warehouse, where they, they had the propaganda radio station that he worked at in Vietnam. My mom wrote home once that um, you can see there's just one guard there, and she said her, her mom must have asked something. Again, can you imagine you're in Idaho getting letters from your daughter in Vietnam, and she's, she'd be like, we're going out to the zoo, oh, but I hear explosions in the distance. And, because that, that, that radio station that you heard the attack on, that wasn't us because that's a well-guarded radio station where Jim works, my dad's name's Jim, you, he, um, it's not well-guarded because it's supposed to be a secret. <laughs> so they were like, okay. Um, this is the inside. Um, so he was the, the American advisor to Hal Seven's Mother Vietnam propaganda radio station. This was a a really um, gray or white, meaning that it was not like a hardcore message, um, but it was run primarily by the Vietnamese. And they would write their own shows, and he would help them out. Um, they would do their own live music. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was actually, he just, it was a really, I think that's why I liked it so much. It's like, it's just a really great place to work and a great group of people. And he um, wrote home that to my mom. He's like, well, you know me. After I congratulated um, Wen Dong, I felt so proud and happy that I felt tears welling up. So I took off. They just wouldn't understand that. There's so much that goes into each one of these little improvements that you have your whole heart and soul in it. And you probably overreact when it finally comes off. So he had his heart and soul in this, this program with these people. And it, with this effort, and he was, he just really believed it would work. And so it's a little like heartbreaking and painful that at so late in the game, he really felt like the efforts that they were doing was gonna be successful, like getting Nixon into China, like really changing things up. Um, and he said, so he's like, I'm one who thinks our efforts here are or were not wasted. These are great people, and I will not concede one inch to the communists. In that, I sort of feel like JFK when he told the people in Berlin, if I'm, <laughs> if been I'm Berliner, even though I don't know much more than Hi Mott Ba. <laughs> <laughs> Does somebody, anybody know the Berliner yeah. thing? Or Evan, have you heard of it before? Because it's so, so much. He, so JFK 
wanted to be, you know, show a solidarity with the people of Berlin. So he says, ich bin ein Berliner, <clears throat> which really actually means I am a jelly pastry. <laughs> so Berliner is a jelly pastry. And, um, so, but the, his translator actually helped him and everybody was laughing. It was good nature, it came off good nature. I recently had this translated in a, a South Vietnamese person I'm now acquainted with, but he's like, it's actually not hi mat ba, it's mat ba hai ba. He's like, so my dad didn't even know how to count one, two, three. <laughs> he said two, two, one, three. Um, and so you can see the, the look on his face. He's just uh, very open, open face. He really, uh, again, I called, it, I called it for the love of Vietnam for two reasons. One, because he had so much love for Vietnam and the Vietnamese people. And two, because it's also like the question of, oh, God, for the love of Vietnam. Yeah. <laughs> somebody, somebody make this all make sense. Another great book is Francis Fitzgerald, Fire in the Lake, if you want a really in-depth, long look at their history. Um, and she interviewed one <clears throat> person who worked in uh, administration, but he said, don't you realize that this whole Vietnam War, the whole thing is based on racism. This hatred of, you know, the brown people in that country, we can just go and take over and stuff. And uh, that was heartbreaking when I read that and really good, oh, I guess, you know, from the very beginning in the 40s and 50s, having this kind of um, colonialist or totalist, you know, like we know, right? We didn't know the Vietnamese people. We didn't know the South people from the South or the North. We, we didn't know our enemy. We didn't even know our allies. Um, but for, for all that, my dad um, did have a great love for the people he worked with and the work he was doing. This beautiful woman is Mai Lan, who um, Frank snapped from that other book. So the ultimate credit for this evacuation my dad um, took, undertook belonged to Mai Lan. Vivacious, Americanized, she had won the affection of her CIA patrons and was thereby able to ensure that she and her co-workers would not be forgotten. So House 7, Mother Vietnam, she was the voice of Mother Vietnam that would go on and say like, um, good you know, good afternoon, comrades out in the field. We're here today to support you. And one thing they would do is they would read the list of people who had died. I don't know how they got this, but one thing that happened, especially with the North, they lost so many people that nobody knew what happened to their family members. They were just dead and gone, buried in mass graves. If, you know, they were, their bodies survived at all. And so they would actually read some of the names and so people, they were broadcasting it to the North. Some people found out what happened to their family members. Um, so she had this beautiful voice and she also had a coworker who had a very similar voice. And um, so my dad worked fairly closely with her. One reason it was so hard to write about all of this was that it's fairly certain that he ended up having an affair with her. We don't know whether it was like during the time, all that two years, or was it just like when they were on the escape? Um, and I said to my son, Dylan, I said, well, gosh, you know, it's hard. Like, what if my dad rescued these thousand people just because of my lawn? <laughs> he just, he's so smart, he was like, mom, he could have just left with my lawn. He didn't have to take the other 99 <laughs> people. I was like, oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> he didn't have to like move everyone up. But, she, she was a, a, like a force to be reckoned with. And interestingly, over the years, how seven people have gotten together every year, and I, I did go to one of their reunions. Um, she's never attended, and I've tried to get in touch with her quite a few times. I even found her daughter through a college friend, um, just that somebody who was on Facebook, and um, she wouldn't answer. She wouldn't agree to talk to me. How old is she, how old is she now? How old is she now? What do you think? Um, she was about 25, a 20, little bit less than 25, so she's about 75. So, um, I am friends with somebody who was about, who's uh, 80, and she's, man, she's gone, she just came back from Vietnam, and she's just like full of life and spit and vinegar. Um, I think I, I might stop a picture of her. So the question is, why were we there as a family? In 1970, so in 1972, um, the Paris Peace Accords are signed, and that means that there's peace in this fair land. The Americans are going to go home, finally, and we're just going to, South Vietnam and North Vietnam are going to each have their own space. 
Well, the reason that book is called Decent Interval was really Kissinger and the whole American approach was to create a decent interval so that American troops could leave and the country's not going to fall apart for a decent interval so it doesn't really look like our fault. Um, in, in a long series of bad decisions, it's just kind of another bad one. Uh, but, and I used to really like hate Graham Martin was I was reading about and realizing the things that happened because of him. And then I began to really ha feel a bit sorry for him and really, um, he was chosen kind of as a patsy to go and be the ambassador in Vietnam. They knew things were gonna kind of go, go wrong um, but he had lost his son, well, an adopted nephew in 1965 in the war. And somehow that made him just want to make everything okay to the point of blindness. But he was literally still at his desk the night of the 30th when we were all supposed to be out. A helicopter landed with President Ford at the time. Orders from President Ford on the helicopter that the, the, the pilot had to go down and say, look, the president says you need to get on this helicopter right now. Like you wow. cannot be captured by the Northern communists and put, be put everyone in that situation. And they literally dragged him because he was still thinking somehow he's going to pull off a diplomatic situ um, solution. So he just had such, uh, uh, almost to the, the point of delusion that this was going to end up, it's going to be okay. So, in 1974, even though things were falling apart, the ceasefire was not working. He's like, it's safe for families. Oh, you need to go. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, it's safe for families. And because my parents had been apart for two years, and we had been apart from our dad for two years, we're like, hey, we'll call the light and we go. <laughs> so this is, you know, um, a picture of them at Christmas. And I like to think they, they're really feeling close. This is my dad and I at the beach. He had written before I got we got there. He's like, I think you'll like it here. <laughs> Should be a great adventure for our whole family. Um, so he was in a bit of denial too, right? <laughs> Interestingly enough though, um, we did have some good time. That's me and my brother. You could just barely see our dog, Daffy. Oh, and by the way, a tissue is Daffy because we had a dog that my mom had to take care of. Um, and you can see in the back, there's the windows, right? Those are plastic. When I got there and I said to my older brother, Chris, I was like, why? How come it's not glass? Why don't we have glass in it? Because in case of bombs, they won't shatter. I was like, oh, isn't that great? Somebody's thinking about our safety and well-being. <laughs> but you start to, you, you, especially as a child, you start to normalize things. It's just yeah. what, how it is, okay. Mm -hmm. Um, this we went to a school called the Phoenix Study Group, which had existed before the, the ceasefire or the Paris Peace Accords, and then came back online in 19, late 1970, uh, the school year of late 1973-74. So it was kind of just sort of a you know a normal place. Um, and oh, the one thing somebody recently published this with the, the recent fighting in the Middle East. He said. Yeah, we served in Vietnam too. Uh, the rockets and the flares in today's news brings flashbacks. So I didn't really felt for um, the guy that printed that. And um, I didn't. I don't feel like I have that kind of um, you know post traumatic stress from from loud things. But I've heard of other people in my peer group from there that do. Um, right after we got there. So we got there in Ju July 1974, August 8th. Nixon announces that he's he's resigning. And my mom wrote home, well, it looks as though Nixon has had it. Even, I'm so sick of it, even if he is wrong and makes one want to leave. So you can kind of imagine that here we were told it's all safe and then things are starting to fall apart. And back in the States, what's that going to do in um, over where we are. My mom writes home, period, you know, we can't walk in the streets. It's not safe. We're not supposed to be around any large crowd. We have to, aren't supposed to carry our handbags. And people periodically do burn themselves up, she wrote, in September. And I couldn't find any, any um, record of self-immolation at that time. But this picture 
JFK said, no news picture in history has generated as much emotion around the world as this one. And this is um, Kwan Duk Tu, I mean, Tik Kwan Duk. And this was in 1963, actually, that's, um, he was protesting, something we never did in America. I think. Well, actually, one person in America did burn themselves up in protest of the Vietnam War. And I, for many years, I thought, well, he was protesting the Vietnam War, the fighting between the North and the South. He was protesting the government we were supporting. He was protesting the Chu government. Vietnam was primarily a Buddhist country. Chu was a Catholic. And for some reason, just like any dictator or, or person that has no um, tolerance, he was um, abusing Buddhists treating them poorly, killing them outright. So it, it went to this extreme where a monk felt like he had to immolate himself in order to get the attention. And this actually put Vietnam on the map for a lot of people around the world. Mm -hmm. um, so it was 63 before everything started ramping up. Um, but just the extreme of something like that. Um, meanwhile, so my mom's like, we can't, we can't walk around the city. Well, we went to the zoo. She said it was a pleasant surprise, much better than the zoo in Korea or Taiwan. You can see how happy I am to be at the zoo. <laughs> but I think this was part of our brownie group. Um, and then, so it's just this funny juxtaposition of doing normal things and having these crazy, outrageous things. On Halloween in October, um, we go to school as normal. There's already been um, some protests in the streets because the two regime was knocking or was um, locking down on people. And so we get to school, and then suddenly we're getting picked up again, um, bustled into the car, and our driver had to go through the streets really. Um, there was just huge amounts of people and things burning and uh, barbed wire. And my mom wrote home the demonstrations at the beginning of the month. She wrote this in November, so were really bad. On the 31st, the kids went off to school as usual, and then I received a call saying that the school was going to be shut down and send my driver to get the kids home. And the next day in the press courier um, in California, riot police battle two protesters, violence paralyzes Saigon. Um, so we ended up having to do Halloween at home. And um, I don't remember like being terrified in the car, but it was like watching like as we were trying to get through. But obviously, you know, you're eight years old. You can't be thinking this is a good thing. And then we go home and my mom, um, <laughs> my mom and dad go upstairs with my sister. And we all went up one by one and go into the dark rooms. And then they jump down and scream. And we scream too. And then my mom wrote home. She was like, oh, we had so much fun on Halloween. We had to stay home. But we scared the hell out of the kids. <laughs> I was like, is that, like, is that really necessary? Did we have to do that? I don't know. Um, but then, you know, then the next month, there we are, we're going on a wonderful, relaxing day on the Saigon River. That's me just sitting on the front, and uh, my brother Jimmy getting uh, driving lessons. But again, that day, I, I looked out, and it's all green, and I said, my husband's just looking like, oh, so this is a great day. And my brother Chris is there. It's like, there could be a Viet Cong out there anywhere. I was like, what's a Viet Cong? He's like, we can just get shot standing right here. And I was like, oh, oh, that's Okay, can I go home and play with my dolls? <laughs> so we get through, we went away for um, Christmas to Thailand, which was really nice, and then a um, great break. And we come back, and the country started falling, one of the biggest provinces fell. And there was, um, day, three days of mourning over that. In February, so my dad started to see the signs, things are going down, and he asked my lawn, what what's gonna happen if if the communists take over. And so my dad already talked to us about that. He's got a rifle, he's gonna shoot each of us and then to commit suicide. So that's better than falling into the hands of the communists. So this is, so my dad is sitting here thinking, one, he doesn't want that to happen to my lawn, whether they were um, <clears throat> just still friends or had gotten involved. Two, it's not just her, everybody else in that, that uh, House 7 is probably thinking the same thing. We'd already had Viet Cong. Um, there, at one point, my mom writes to her parents, um, Jim found out that there was a VC in, the, in his office, 
the guy obviously probably got taken in the back and shot. And then he goes, she was like, but you know, they, and they probably know where we um, live, but they probably knew that before we got there. And in fact, one day I came home and I heard something upstairs. I run up the stairs and my, my brother's room is so, it's hot in Vietnam, right? And the, the, the house was a square with a, a hole in the middle for air ventilation. And we also had a little fish pond in there that we used to swim and play in. But my brother's room, you had to walk outside through that, that um, inner courtyard. That was the only thing. And I go up there and my dad's drilling a hole in the wall. And I was like, well, what's going on? What's he doing trying to drill a hole in a cement wall? It's like three feet thick. And it turns out he's trying to create a tunnel so that my brother John can get to our bedroom without having to go outside. It turns out John heard something in the door and they assumed, were assuming that it was a Viet Cong person who had come down and, and um, delayed into the, onto his walkway. So after that, he slept in our room. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, everybody started to get you know, really worried. This is not a safe situation. On the 30th of March, um, there's Vietnam there, so about halfway through Da Nang, which was where the, um, Viet, uh, we first landed with our troops. And we were actually greeted in 1965 with, um, with flowers, you know, that here's the Americans are gonna come and, and um, help us with our situation here. Um, so, one other, one other thing is, when we did go there, you know, that it, it was in 1954 after Paris had been kicked out, that this country was split between North and South. Different people moved south and north, but there were families, like you said, I think you said, Lynn, brother to brother. It's a civil war, so it was a very um, arbitrary. We're just going to cut at the 17th parallel and put the people of north and down south. And we thought that we were going to be able to, to win the popular vote, but it turned out most people wanted to just be Vietnamese and not, not have, so they would have voted for Ho Chi Minh. The government couldn't let, couldn't let it go to a vote, um, and it became it ended up becoming a war. So what leaving looked like? This I don't have a picture of our family at the airport anymore, but this is a picture of the, the boy in the back. Paul is still a friend of the family, and there's some other people. They're they're like 15 years old and are drinking Budweiser. Um, I was like, it looks like a, you know, like a camp. Everybody's just having fun and leaving. This not really. That's. So again, like, this is juxtaposition of things that are fun and things that aren't. Um, our family getting out, so things are falling apart, and, and my mom just said, hey, we got to get these kids out of here. We can't just sit around and wait. So somehow, I'm not even sure how, because Graham Martin was not letting people out of the country. Um, we probably said we were going to go visit uh, my mom's mom. Um, my brother Mike writes this little letter home. Dear Dad, we had a real hard trip and are staying in Guam in Honolulu because number one engine fell down. And then he's like, sorry, I didn't get to um, write more. And my mom wrote in her diary, weary. Um, and I just want to give a little shout out to my brother Mike. He took all my parents' letters and um, different documents and scanned them in a few years before his death. And he died in 2014. He was 52. Um, he suffered from quite a few different uh, mental illnesses that started with alcoholism and just got worse and worse over the years. It's hard to tell if it came from the Vietnam experiences. There were other alleged um, priest abuse situations that might have happened a little earlier, but um, it, was just, it was very devastating, but he was a really good guy in a lot of ways, and his work made it possible that I could do all this different. Um, so the reason it was so um, weirdy was we, we took off and then the, the, we got to Guam, but before we landed, we had to jettison fuel. One of the engines went out and we landed, they had to spray down the plane. And again, you're sitting on there with like, you know, seven people <coughs> on the flight. Well, it's then they, um, they fixed the plane, we tried to take off, it didn't work, we had to go back, we ended up staying in Guam. And it was only, it ended up being like a three-day trip that was, just exhausting. And then we get to Idaho, and it's 
32 degrees, we sit in a tropical situation, right? We, no, no, we didn't have coats or anything. <laughs> we all froze to death. Um, and uh, that's what my mom just wrote, just weird. So we left on April 3rd. We were supposed to have left on April 4th on a, a flight called the Operation Navy Lift. Um, another aspect of the war was that a lot of servicemen had relationships with Vietnamese women and then the servicemen left and so we had a lot of amerration whereas my mom said in one letter she's like the half breeds which of course you never say now but they're um, half Vietnamese half um, Asian and they would have been terribly treated at the hands of the communists anything had anything to do with Americans it was portrayed with so, you know, that was not going to go well so President Ford um, instituted this Operation Baby Lift, which was a great idea. It's like, let's just get these planes in there. We'll just take out guns. This plane, we were supposed to go because my mom, as, in addition to having so many kids, just uh, was always volunteering, always going to orphanages, always helping and donating. So I think she wanted to help on this. But at the last minute, she thought, oh my gosh, I have you know, seven kids. We're going to take up too many seats. We'll go the day before. So I just thought it was supposed to be on this plane. It took off, a latch was not done, uh, buckled in well, and the, the back blew out. And of the 200 people on it, most of, there was oh. like a 50%, 50% um, dead, right? Um, they, and the people wrote, they were just like, already things felt bad in Saigon, but at this point it just felt like that all the life went out of the city. And my dad just wrote home, one tragedy follows another, I cry. My whole life, until I was like a little over 40, I, it took, I suddenly realized that I had lived my whole life feeling guilty because I had lived, that had I been on a plane, maybe it would have been me, but somehow I wasn't, so these orphans died instead of me, which was, I felt, you know, I was a heavy burden to carry for many years. Um, and true as it was, um, you can look on the little display at how there's us, you know, cute little American kids, and then right after, we kind of always lived in the shadow of people that were um, living with much more difficult circumstances than us. It's really co colored the way I lived my life. Um, so in that same letter that my dad writes home, He's, he's decided he's going not going to leave Vietnam by himself. I may get shot by the bureaucracy, your husband may get shot by the bureaucracy, he said, but I intend to get my people out regardless of the consequences. So somehow he's thinking his back in his mind, I'm going to have to go against what Graham Martin wants, which is us all to stay here and pretend everything's okay and things are going to get better. Um, and he, he says, um, the talk is of getting one million people out. I don't believe it. They may try and cry and then say they're sorry. I'm not operating that way. I may fail, but I intend to do what is necessary before the crunch comes and succeed. There are many details I can't write here for obvious reasons. If we make it, it will be an odyssey worth writing a book about. <laughs> if we don't, it still will. So thank God you made it. <laughs> and um, you know, I read this, I was like, oh, it's an odyssey worth writing a book about. So OK. Again, when I got the call, it's like, OK, I'll do it. I'll tell you a little bit about the evacuation through um, the trip I took in 2015. I was like, OK, I'm going to follow my father's footsteps. And it was funny because I got to Vietnam, and you, just, I don't know, it's just so classic. You're so caught up in your own thing. It's like, it's the 40th anniversary of the end of the war. It's their 40th Independence Day. <laughs> And they call it the American War, which makes sense. It was the Americans who were there fighting a war in their country. We call it the Vietnam War because we're thinking it's over there. But um, so anyway, there was a lot of brouhaha. It was kind of hard to get around at times. And um, it seemed a little, a little, <laughs> I was like, OK, we're here for your Independence Day when you picked us out. Um, this picture became the iconic picture of the evacuation. However, does, does anybody remember this or no. know anything about it? Well, so it's actually, what's that? What the helicopters had a tough time getting them off the ground, right? Something like that? Yeah, like so they, and they, they went on the embassy roof. Um, yeah, right. the, the Marines at the embassy and other people had to like chop down trees and the 
the um, embassy parking lot to make enough room, um, but they used the uh, the roof. But this is actually not the embassy roof. For years and years, it was one of those things that people thought it was because it was on the cover of Time. Um, it was on the cover of uh, the Washington Post. It's actually at the top of this little apartment building right there, and um, another a man that had got that's a modern building behind, but had gone out and taken a picture and gotten that. Um, and this, I'm standing in the church that we used to go to, um, looking out, and the, the, the building is right in the back there. Um, so, actually, yeah, that's, um, but that, that was the, the iconic image of people getting out on helicopters, because as the North Vietnamese um, surrounded the city and were crushing in, that was the only way to get out. On the, the night of the 29th, they bombed. Thompson at airport, so there was no fixed wing uh, way to get out of the country, and it was only the helicopters, which is a very hard way to get a lot of people out, um, which is why um, literally you know, a lot of Vietnamese were just left standing there, having been told they were going to be helped out, and then literally just watching the last helicopters go, and you're just standing there, and the, the enemy is coming your way. Um, you know, the, the North Vietnamese, the means ended up not just spraying people down. It wasn't a bloodbath, but um, the country didn't do very well after that. A lot of people were put in re-education camps or just starved because the economy was so bad. Um, so my dad was like, well, I'm not waiting for it to get to that point. And he created, a, you know, so it's in psychological warfare, which is really telling a good story, convincing somebody of, of what you want to convince them of. So he came up with the story that he was going to take House 7 and all their radio propaganda um, programs and get them out of the crunch of Saigon. And he, he with the help of some other people, came up with this idea of Phu Quoc, which is this little tiny island down at the um, base of, of um, Vietnam, actually used to belong to Cambodia. So he gets, he comes up with this idea, and, and with the help of his um, direct supervisor who didn't want to go on the evacuation but helped him got permission to take his people down to this island. Um, and this is just another he, a list of all the different things he's like. I've been told that our evacuation plan, because it's the only well thought out one, was to be a model for the others. So later they actually um, thought that it was a, a good idea. But he, has, he got like two tons of rice, 20 gallons of nook mom, which is this fish sauce, which uh, smells kind of pungent a little, <laughs> not, not so popular with us, medical supplies um, and, and nurses to come along. So he's, you know, he's thinking soup to nuts, this whole thing. And he was like, I really want to just get going. Um, on uh, the 21st of April, they start taking um, people, shuttling them to the airport and getting them on these CF -40, C-47s. Um, a lot of these Saigonese that went, so it was 250 employees, and he started making lists, and it was like, you could all bring three or four family members. Um, so it turned out to merge into about a thousand people with each of those employees bringing a few family members. But if you can imagine, you know, you might say you have eight people in your family, grandma and grandpa live with you, but they're like, I'm not leaving Vietnam. There's just no way, I'm too old, I can't do it, or I don't want to go. Your son is married to somebody on the next block who doesn't want to go. So families were leaving close, and even family members, that they were not ostensibly ever going to see again. Um, and some had never been on an airplane. So it was really quite the, you know, that not easy, not easy decisions. Um, this is the, the base, the, the um, this is actually my, like my dad's map that he had in his office I was looking at. <clears throat> and I would see my brother scanned in. So the, the, the top to a dome was where the air base was, and they had to get down to this bottom place um, and toy to get out through the harbor there. Um, and something that was actually really fun use of Google Photos, um, there's this little calendar on the right that shows like they left on the 21st, and they didn't know at that time how long they were going to be there. We know now it's April 30th, right? But it could have been, might have been months. Um, they found this old abandoned military installation, and he describes it in his writing: ten buildings, you know, in two rows, and two, the two at the end of the smaller, and they used for the administration. 
So when I went in Google Photos and I zoomed in that gun, it was like, it was crazy. It was like going into another world. I was like, wow, look at this, there it is. Um, and they ended up calling it Camp 7. They didn't have running water, so they could walk down to the beach. And um, I found the beach, Kem Beach.